Hello, good people. Thank you for watching this video. In this video, we're going to cover a few topics. Um, first, we're going to talk about the, uh, the drama metaphor of service uh, to help introduce why entrepreneurs need control in their, um, in their businesses and firms. We're then going to segue into uh, the control process and need for standards. Uh, we're going to give you some important definitions and um, you know how we instill the this this idea of control, uh, why we do it, and um, based on that, I'm going to introduce assignment number two to you, which is your standard recipes and your ingredient consolidation list. After this particular class, you should be able to discuss service as a drama, its components, and the need for control. You'll be able to discuss uh, and identify the steps in the control process and you know why they're important. We'll also be able to demonstrate an understanding of standards by creating standard recipes and ingredient consolidation lists through assignment number two. So here's where we're going to begin to talk about service as a drama. Over the years, many scholars have found it useful to uh, to use metaphors to define and explain uh, various phenomena and, and, and concepts. Um, and that's what we're going to do here. The reason I'm putting uh, a service aspect to this week's learning is that regardless of your entrepreneurial uh, venture, most food related businesses end up being services. Uh, there are a few exceptions uh, with production. Uh, however, you know, restaurants, uh, food trucks, pop-up restaurants, catering, uh, things like that. These are all service firms, okay? So to help us understand the need for control, we have to be able to describe what service is uh, and the components of service, okay? So various service uh, metaphors for service have been debated among scholars over the years, okay? All of them have merit, okay? Um, while all of them have merit, some of they differ in, in, in quite a few ways, uh, mainly because of you know how people understand what service is. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to share with you my preferred um, metaphor, which is the drama. Okay, uh, I use this particular metaphor in my own research, combined with a memory dominant logic and uh, you know disconfirmation of customer expectations. We're not necessarily going to go over that here. Uh, some of the metaphors that have been used in the past is service as a relationship. Okay, so obviously, um, if we think about customer loyalty, right, uh, that implies some sort of relationship between a business uh, and customers. Right. Um, we've also found research that shows that there is a, a high level of emotional attachment of food, sorry, between food and people. OK, so there's a little bit of relationship there as well. Uh, this particular metaphor has has exploded in areas uh, such as relational marketing specifically um, in that, you know, we create in service, we try to create a relationship with our customers to keep them coming back, right? So relational marketing is, is very simply the process of acquiring, maintaining, uh, sorry, acquiring and maintaining good relationships with your customers because we understand customer loyalty is how service firms grow. Other, uh, other metaphors, uh, and the next one I have here is service as a conflict, okay? Which brings up the idea that you know there are different levels of hospitality, you know, absolute hospitality and, um, uh, conditional hospitality. It's also the idea that when a customer comes into a restaurant or a service firm, there is a lack of a relationship at first. And because of that lack of a relationship, that ambiguity, there can be conflict, right? Especially because um, absolute hospitality or, you know, giving away the farm uh, is, is what people use to describe it is, is impossible, right? It's, it's think about it as the difference between going to your mom and dad's for dinner or going to a restaurant. For example, um, I know that if I go to my mom and dad's, uh, if there's pizza in the fridge, I can eat that pizza. <laughs> I don't have to ask, I can eat it, right? That is absolute hospitality, right? I'm privy to pretty much anything my host has. Um, however, in most services or in the service industry, 
uh, that's absolutely not possible because we, we have control. We need control, right? Uh, we can't simply give you know uh, a single customer on, three entrees for the, the for the price of one, right? So because of that, it creates a little bit of conflict. Um, the next one is service as a culture. Okay, uh, the reason why this metaphor ha has has become a metaphor is because there's a lot of cultural aspects to food. Right. Each culture has their own different version of, you know, particular dishes, um, different cuisine types, things like that. Um, there are also, uh, you know, within each service, there's different standards that each each business has. Uh, and this kind of describes or helps describe the culture, because in, in various cultures, you know, um, you can do some things here in Canada that you can't do in other places. Right. So there are similarities to culture as well. My preferred metaphor for drama, uh, sorry, for service is as a drama. OK, um, the reason I I mean, it, this is what I this is how I prefer to think of service. You can think of it as, you know, another metaphor, if you like, you can create your own or you know what have you. But I believe uh, service as a drama more accurately captures the major components of service delivery. OK, in that service, just like a drama or a movie has actors, if you think about it. So a customer is an actor. So is uh, your staff. It has scripts. So uh, scripts are essentially just, you know, the social involvement or the behaviors and, and discourse of the actors. So what they do, essentially, there's the set. So. Um, most service happens with, or, you know, most food service happens, you know, within a restaurant or, um, you know, in catering, there could be a hall or something like that. So there's a setting. Okay. And there's a performance, right? Um, you've seen movies before. I've seen movies before. Um, I know a couple of movies that I like, and there's a couple of movies I don't like, right? Um, the reason why I like those and don't like those is based on the performance, right? So just like service, can have a good or bad ending depending on you know the actors, the scripts that they follow, and the setting. Um, movies also, or dramas also have a performance, right? So if everything goes well, so the actors adhere to their scripts uh, in the appropriate setting, there can be a good performance, right? If they do not adhere to their scripts and their roles, uh, there is a poor performance, much like a play or a movie. So um, here, uh, I believe in the next slide, I'm going to uh, go into a bit more detail of these, uh, these four components. Um, I'm just going to tell you right now, it's the scripts of service or food service that help create great performance. Okay. Now, these scripts can come in various, various forms, like, but for today, we're going to be focusing on standards, standard procedures, standard recipes, things like that, because that's what helps create um the drama itself but also again a good performance so going a bit deeper into the, the components of the drama or the service drama if you will we have actors so this defines or the the actors in this particular drama are the service provider and the guest they each have different roles to play okay the setting is the service scape so wherever that service takes place um, it could be in a restaurant. It could be in a client's home. Um, they, it, it depends on the context of the service business. Uh, we have the scripts, which are the processes and standards that create consistency and give the actors their cues, right? Um, for example, there's a serving process in most restaurants. Um, when you, if you work in a restaurant and you're, you're in the kitchen, you're on the line, you know that they have standard recipes uh, and standards. These are, uh, you know, so these are processes of understanding what you do and how you cook those dishes. But there's also quality and quantity of standards. So how many shrimp go into your linguine or um, what is what kind of freshness uh, or how fresh are your um you know, your produce and your vegetables, right? So these give the actors their cues and help uh, create consistency from guest to guest and also a great performance, which is a good segue. So the next component is the performance itself. If all actors in this scene or in the movie or the play 
play their part using the scripts that are designated to the roles that they're playing, there's usually a good performance, okay? Um, so for assignment number two, we're going to be focusing specifically on the scripts, okay? Um, we're going to be developing standard uh, recipes, which include both quality and quantity standards, which we're going to talk about in a second. It also has a method of creating these dishes, which is a process, right? We're also going to be completing an ingredient consolidation list where we identify the standard as purchase cost, okay? This is going to create consistency for your business, um, but also your customers, okay? And the idea here is that once we've created these standards, it will help us create consistency, but also good performances uh, for our guests. And I'm going to tell you why that's important in the next slide. The use of scripts. Um, if we think about the, the scripts of service as processes and standards, uh, these things help service providers uh, control the drama or uh, you know, the, the business essentially, and also increases the likelihood of a good performance for your customers or your clients, okay? Um, indications, but also good benefits, <laughs> or sorry, uh, beneficial aspects of good performance may seem fairly intuitive, but they're very important and include happy customers, right? Happy customers are a good thing to have because that will increase customer satisfaction and possibly, uh, but not... Ex <laughs> possibly uh, increased customer loyalty, okay? Which can be found in positive word of mouth, okay? That's a great benefit of uh, customer loyalty and repurchase intentions, okay? There's a lot of research on customer loyalty or the benefits of customer loyalty. Um, if we have a loyal customer base based on, you know, good scripts of service, we will have positive word of mouth. Okay, this means that our customers who are happy and loyal will tell their friends about us, right? They're, it's like an internal marketing department that doesn't cost anything, so it's great. Um, we also have increased repurchase intentions, so happy customers will come back, okay? This brings up the idea of a customer lifetime value um, or the value of a customer for life. Right? We have to understand that in our industry, the relationship that we have with our customers is not limited to one transaction, or at least it doesn't have to be. If we adhere to the scripts of service, whereby creating a good performance and happy customers who are loyal, um, they're going to keep, keep coming back. Right, So we're going to generate a relationship with them. So that's why the scripts of service are so important is because it increases the likelihood of a good performance and creates happy customers who are satisfied and loyal. Ooh, just gonna put these all up. Okay, so as the previous discussion I may have kind of noted that these scripts of service, again, the processes and the standards, um, tell us that we need to instill control in our organization. So now I'm going to go over some important control definitions. Firstly, control itself, not to be confused with power. Control is a process um, used to direct, regulate, and restrain the actions of people so that your goals can be achieved, right? We got to put uh, control in our organizations so that you as a business owner can achieve your goal. You know, whatever that goal is, it could be high quality food, it could be making lots of money, you're the entrepreneur, it's your goal. Uh, we have cost controls, which is very similar to the definition for control, which is the process to regulate costs and guard against excessive costs. In creating cost control or control over our costs, we need to identify our as purchased um, cost for our ingredients, which is what we're doing in assignment number two, but also cost out our recipes. Okay, um, this, uh, in, that's assignment number three, and it helps us guard against excessive costs. We have standards, which is rules or measures established for making comparisons or judgments. Okay, so uh, that sounds a little wordy. In, in, in quite be, uh, quite normal terms, standards are, are just rules, okay? They help us identify if something is right or is wrong. For example, if one of your standards 
is for your staff to be on time and they're not on time, say they come in 15 minutes late, you know that that's not correct because your rule is to be uh, on time, right? Um, these standards help us create consistency in our scripts of service and allow us to say something is right or something is wrong, which is, you know, making a judgment or a comparison, if you will. Okay? We have various standards in our industry, for example, we have standard recipes, uh, we have standard uh, procedures, we have standard costs, which is the next definition. A standard cost is the cost of goods and services identified and approved by management. So in assignment number two, this is where we start to identify our standard costs. Okay, so we are identifying the cost of the goods or the service that we are going to be uh, proposing in uh, in our assignments, right? So we're going to find the as purchase cost or the standard as purchase cost of our ingredients. We have some additional uh, important cost control or sorry control definitions. Firstly, uh, standards can be broken up into two uh, different kinds of standards with respect to food. First, quality standards involves some sort of descriptive non-numerical measure okay so this is things like fresh never frozen right um, this is descriptive of the product right uh, and you know uh, you need to know your quality standards before you go and buy the food that you need right for example if you are saying that you have fresh never frozen uh, tuna on your menu you need to based on that quality standard, go and find that particular product. It also has implications for receiving. So for example, if your tuna is supposed to be fresh and never frozen, based on your quality standards, and you're receiving a product that has been frozen, then it is not to your standards, okay? We also have uh, quantity standards, which is involves some sort of numerical measure, okay? Um, so if your uh, menu says, uh, you know, you have, let's say, a, a shrimp uh, linguine, a shrimp linguine, okay, uh, and you say, uh, you know, 14 fresh, never frozen shrimp, lightly sauteed in butter, uh, lightly sauteed in a cream sauce, um, tossed with linguine pasta, garnished with some basil, okay. The quality standard there is fresh, never frozen shrimp, and the quantity standard is 14 shrimp, okay? These definitions are important because these definitions, basically, when you put them together, they describe standard recipes, okay? So a standard recipe um, pretty much tells you how to make the dish, but it also includes the name, of the uh, ingredient which can include quality standards so fresh never frozen shrimp um, excuse me and the quantity standard so how much of the product goes into the recipe so the last two definitions I want to go over uh, that are important control definitions we have standard procedures which are uh, you know the, the correct methods and routines for day-to-day -day operations Okay, so as I had mentioned before, your standard recipes will have quality and quantity standards in them. It'll also have a method section, which I'll show you in a, just a little bit. The method of creating each dish is a standard procedure. Once identified as correct, um, well, you, if, you're, if you're creating a standard recipe, it is the correct method. Um, it tells your staff how or through what procedure they should be making each one of your dishes. Okay, and it's exceptionally important because, um, you know, sometimes uh, dishes don't come out uh, the way they should. You can use standard procedures to help correct a, a employee's behavior um, based on what they're doing and what you have established as the correct method to create a dish. Um, last definition is a control system, which is essentially just a combination of all the standards and um, uh, you know control techniques that you're using in your firm or your, your 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 business, right? So your standard procedures, your quality standards, your quantity standards, all these rules come together to create a control system. Okay, this way 
uh, your staff are putting the correct amount of each ingredient in each dish. Okay, they're using the correct ingredient itself, and they're creating it in a way that is correct based on what you have told them to do. So now we're going to talk about the steps in the control process. Okay, um, I'm going to put them all up here. There we are. The very first step, and you know, arguably the most important and the inspiration for your assignment number two, is to establish your standards and your standard procedures for your business. Okay, these are essentially the rules and what people should be doing to achieve your goals. Okay, um, with respect to assignment number two, you are uh, creating your your standard recipes, which include both quality, quantity and standard procedures and you're also collecting the as purchase costing information for all of the ingredients uh, used in your standard recipes okay these are understood as standard costs okay once all of these things are established okay largely through assignment number two the next step in the control process is to train all of your staff to follow these rules right um, Training uh, that we're not necessarily going to go into this uh, course is also important because if you don't train your people to follow the rules, they don't know how to follow your rules. Nobody wants to be bad at their job, uh, so training is exceptionally important. Okay, So at this point, you've established your rules, you have trained all your staff to follow your rules, now it's time to monitor the performance of your staff based on your standards and you compare it with their performances, right? So again, uh, if your standard is to come in on time and a staff member comes in late, well, there's a difference between your standard and their actual performance, right? You need to do something, which is a good segue into the uh, next step in the pro uh, control process, which is take appropriate action to correct deviations from standards. So essentially, you have to take a, a appropriate action or corrective corrective action um, to how help people understand uh, that their performance is not meeting your standards okay um, like I said people don't want to be uh, bad at their job so you know it's your job as an owner or even as a manager to to let them know what they could improve upon right so you have to take some corrective uh, appropriate action uh, the last thing I'll mention here is that I find some people in the industry yeah, we're busy people and sometimes it's easy to let deviations or you know people breaking the rules slip through the cracks a little bit it's important that you take corrective action because the standard you walk by is the standard you set from our previous example uh, the person coming in late right if that person comes in late obviously it's not to my standard okay um, I've monitored their performance and uh, again I've identified that their actual performance is not to my standards which is beyond time if I do nothing what am I telling that staff member what I'm telling that staff member is it's okay to be 15 minutes late I've set a new standard okay um, by not doing anything I'm telling that person it's a, that it's okay to do what they did and they're going to continue to do that in the future furthermore other people are going to see this happen. They're going to be like, oh, hey, Dave, uh, Dave came in late and, you know, uh, the other Dave, the manager Dave, didn't do anything about it. I guess I can come in late too. So it's important to take corrective action, okay? But for our purposes in this course, we're going to be focusing on um, uh, the first step in the control process, which is creating and designing your standard recipes and your as-purchased standard, uh, as standard costs. Standard recipes. Standard recipes are those designed for a restaurant and are deemed to be the correct way to create a dish or cook a dish. Okay. Standard recipes are essentially a, they can be a piece of paper. Okay. Um, and standard recipes should include the name of the ingredients that go into the recipe, the quantity of the ingredients that go into the recipe, the me the method or preparations and cooking of each of the ingredients to create the dish, as well as any relevant cooking temperatures, right? For example, in baking, temperatures are huge. I know this because I'm a terrible baker, um, but also cooking meats like roasts, um, uh, barbecues, smoking, things like that. Cooking temperatures are very relevant. 
Um, the only other thing I would mention here is that standard recipes also include number of portions that the recipes create and the portion size of each portion, right? Those things will differ recipe to recipe because some recipes you can bulk and other ones you cannot. For example, when I'm cooking uh, a, a New York steak with seasonal veg, that recipe is probably going to have one portion, okay? Whereas if I'm making soup, I can make 10 liters of soup using the same recipe and that will yield many portions, right? So the portion size and the number of portions should be specific and logical to the dish that you're creating. Continuing with standard recipes, um, you may be asking, okay, so why do I do this? Why, why am I creating standard recipes? Seems like a, you know, a make work project. Um, in our industry, we use standard recipes for quite a few things. Um, also, uh, qu sorry, for quite a few things that relate to the control process itself. For example, our standard recipes create a meth have a method section to them, which identifies the right way to make the dish. This is great for training purposes, right? If we have a, an established way of doing something or a standard procedure, we can train our staff to follow those, those standard procedures. We can also, uh, if we know our standard, uh, sorry, our standard recipes, it's good for monitoring because if we know how to make our dish, we know how to identify when it's not being made correctly. It's also useful for corrective action because you can be specific um, in telling a, a, an employee what they're not doing right, right? You can't be like, oh, you did that dish wrong. You have to be specific, okay? specific so that the issue does not happen again. And lastly, um, we can use standard recipes to create nutritional information. Okay, I'm not a nutritionist. I know nothing about nutrition, but I know uh, a lot of the regulations here in Canada and Ontario now require food service organizations to put the nutritional information um, on their on their recipes, or at least um, communicate the nutritional information somehow, and to create that, they use the standard recipes themselves. Generally speaking, we need standard recipes to create and maintain control over our food and our food cost. Right? For example, uh, if somebody is you know not putting enough of an ingredient in the dish, it's going to um, you know possibly affect the customer satisfaction. In not, they're not getting all of what they should be getting for a specific price, and um, it is going to affect your food. It could possibly affect your food cost because if if a, uh, if a staff member puts too much of a product in a dish, um, you know your price is fixed so is your cost so if you're if you're giving more than you should be you're that's an excessive cost so you're not maintaining control of your food more generally um, if somebody is under or over portioning your products um, it could affect the taste of the end product for example I like truffles in very very limited quantities okay if someone were to over portion uh, some truffle oil in, you know, a pasta or on a, um, I don't know what else, you know, that is definitely going to affect the taste. The same thing maybe with uh, shrimp paste, fish, uh, fish sauce, all things like that. Okay, so it's going to affect the taste of your uh, of your dishes as well. More specifically, standard recipes contribute the scripts that are useful in the drama metaphor to create positive performances. Right, it creates consistency. So that your customers, we'll say they're loyal, every time they come back, they know they're going to get the same quality, quantity of the dish that they love, right? So it helps create consistency um, or the scripts that's used in the drama metaphor. Ingredient consolidation. So after we've, we've created our standard recipes uh, by identifying uh, the specific ingredients to be used in our recipes, uh, the quantity of those ingredients and the methods, the cooking temperatures and the portion sizes and whatnot. It's now time that we complete our ingredient consolidation list. Okay, in this portion of the assignment, what you're ask, being asked to do is essentially collect the standard as purchase costs for your ingredients. 
Okay. Uh, to do this, you'll be using the you won't be using the standard recipe worksheet. You'll be using the entrepreneurship worksheet. Okay, specifically the blue tabs. But I'll be going over that in in uh, a few slides. Uh, doing this is is rather important for a few reasons. First, it is very important to uh, in identifying the standard recipe costs. Okay, which is assignment number three. These standard as purchase costs may not be the actual costs that you're going to be using in your uh, costing out your recipes um, due to yields, due to various assumptions, okay, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, when we talk about assignment number three. Um, and in doing so, uh, it's, it'll help you identify if you have any opportunities in your food cost, for example. If through your standard as purchase costs and your standard recipe costs, you think that your standard food cost, so what your food cost should have been, um, is let's say $500 for a week, okay? And then you do your inventory, you calculate your actual food cost, and it's, it's 700, okay? So uh, the difference between 500, what it should have been, and what it is, is 700 so there's a $200 difference between between those two numbers right that means there's an opportunity for you to reduce your food cost okay in this case by by $200 so you're leaving $200 on the table okay you wouldn't be able to know that or come to that conclusion if you didn't know what your standard as purchase costs were or your standard recipe costs lastly your as purchase costs are necessary for menu engineering so that's uh, making your menu perform as as efficiently as possible. So if you remember back to cost controls, um, we use the standard costs to to help um, identify, you know, which uh, which particular menu items are most profitable in our on our particular menu. Uh, if we can understand which ones are profitable, which ones are not, we can make changes to our menu items to make that item uh, more profitable, okay, or even more popular in some cases, okay, whereby making our uh, menu more efficient, okay. Uh, I believe in the next few slides I'm going to be going over a detailed uh, introduction to assignment number two, which I've kind of done already, but I'm going to show you specific aspects of the templates that are to be used. So assignment number two, uh, which is your standard recipes and your ingredient consolidation list. Uh, in my uh, opinion, you completing this assignment um, takes three three steps. Okay, uh, just because there's three steps does not mean that these three steps might take a little bit of time. Okay, so the first step and probably the most time-consuming step is you're going to standardize each of the recipes on your menu from assignment number one. Uh, using the standard recipe template, which is posted on uh, on Blackboard under week two, okay? That's in an Excel document, which I'll show you in a second, with all of the areas that we've talked about before. So name of the ingredient, ingredient quantity, so on and so forth. Once you've completed standardizing each of your menu items, you're going to use the ingredient database, which I've also posted to Blackboard, to search for the costs of each of your ingredients, okay? So the ingredient database is a big Excel file with a bunch of ingredients on it and it's and the cost of each of those ingredients. Okay. Um, in the event that you cannot find an ingredient you need in the database, you can search for the cost elsewhere. It just has to be properly referenced. Okay. Um, and then the third step is based on the costs of each of your ingredients from the ingredient database, you're going to transfer this information to the appropriate blue tabs of the entrepreneur, entrepreneurship worksheet. Okay, we're do, this movement, um, the reason we're for the movement between the two from the database to the worksheet uh, is important for two reasons. One, uh, so that we can uh, use that as purchase cost information, as well as our recipe unit to identify if we need to make any assumptions, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but also because we're going to be using the entrepreneurship worksheet to cost out each recipe. Okay. So now I'm going to go into a bit of a detail of each of the templates you'll be using, how to use them and what information you need to complete them. Okay. 
So here's our standard recipe template. Okay, this one is blank. Okay, um, I'm going to mention what each of these uh, sections are and how to use them. Okay, um, first you need to identify the recipe name. So if I can find a pointer here, uh, pen, we'll, we'll do blue. There we go. So you got to identify the recipe name. Okay, and this is the name based on your menu. You have to identify the amount of portions and portion size for each portion that this recipe will create. Okay, um, put the date in there. Okay, not terribly difficult. And identify any relevant cooking or holding temperatures. Okay. Um, now, as we get down to the standard recipe itself, okay, we've got to fill in some information. We have to identify the ingredient that goes into the recipe, the amount of that ingredient, okay, so the ingredient quantity and then the unit of measure. So let's say the ingredient is, we'll say eggs. I'm not sure if I can do this very well with, oh, I've got a pen. Let's say the ingredient is eggs, okay? Excuse my, <laughs> excuse my writing, okay? And you, you need one, uh, so you need, you need two eggs in your carbonara, okay? Let's just run with that. Okay, so we need two eggs, so two pieces. Two pieces of eggs, so two pieces of eggs in your recipe. And then you have to, you know, uh, mention the method that you're going to, or what method you're going to apply to using the eggs in the recipe. So are you going to whisk them? Okay. Um, are you going to, um, well, you would whisk them, I, I would think. Okay, so you mentioned what you would do with each product in the method row. Okay, it's an important uh, to note that you should be listing your ingredients in uh, the order of use. Okay, so um, as try to think about how you would actually cook the restaurant. What's the first thing you do? Okay, the first thing that you do should be listed first. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So uh, as you can imagine, this may take a bit of time based on your menus, okay? Um, a lot of the feedback I've given in the past for this particular part of the assignment is regarding the method. You have to be specific uh, about how to create this dish, okay? It's not just telling me how each product is prepped, it's telling me how do I combine all of these ingredients, how I combine all these ingredients to create a specific dish. Okay, uh, it has to be detailed yet concise, right? Um, you want it to, like, if you were to give this to somebody, you would want them to be able to, under, be able to understand exactly how to make the dish. Okay, so this is essentially how you create a standard recipe. On Blackboard, I believe I've also um, uh, posted a video of me creating a standard recipe using the template. Please watch it, it will be beneficial. Okay. Um, the next uh, slide, I believe we're going to go into the ingredient database or the uh, entrepreneurship worksheet. So here's a visual of the ingredient database, and I've made a little bit of a typo there. Um, essentially, this is an Excel spreadsheet that has a whole bunch of products, okay, their uh, unit cost, or the unit that they're purchased in, and the price. Okay, so once you've identified all the products you need to create each recipe through your standard recipes, you take, you search for those recipes in the ingredient database. Okay, so let's say we needed uh, beef hearts, okay, for whatever reason, okay. Uh, beef hearts come in one kg, or they're sold by kilogram for $6.00. And 25 cents per kg. So that is your as purchase cost. Okay. You do this for all the ingredients you need. Okay. And in some cases, um, the ingredient will be uh, listed, uh, the pack size of the ingredient will be listed. You need to take that into consideration as well. Okay. For example, what would be an example here? Pigeon. I didn't know you could buy pigeon. Um, so pigeon is sold by piece. So each. And each pigeon is around 600 grams. Okay, so that'll help you with some of your assumptions, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, 
in order to transfer the information for all of the ingredients from this database to your worksheet, uh, I'm going to give you a few tips here. Firstly, um, in terms of finding the ingredients you need, uh, if you hit Control F, okay, a, a search bar or the find function is going to pop up. You just type in the name of the ingredient you need, hit enter, and it's going to take you exactly where you find the costing information for that ingredient in the database. So if I were to type in beef heart, in, uh, sorry, if I was to hit control find, in the search bar, I type in beef heart because that's what I need, and I hit enter, it would take me right here in the database. So it'll speed up you finding the specific ingredients you need. Okay. Once I've found the ingredient I need, over here in the check column, if I put a one in in that in that particular cell, um, do that for all of the ingredients that you need. Okay, and then up here there's a little a little drop-down menu. Okay, if you click that drop-down menu and you hit one, there's going to be several boxes that you can check. If you check one, it will consolidate this entire list, which is like 35. <laughs> uh, I don't even know how many products. There's a lot of products on here. It will consolidate all of the products you need by the ones you've identified by putting a one in. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Try it out. Let me know if you're having issues. Okay. Once you've done that, you have the basis for transferring a consolidated list of your products to your consolidation list, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. So our entrepreneurship worksheet. Um, for this portion of the assignment, you're going to be using the blue tabs. Okay. So you're using the blue tabs of the entrepreneurship worksheet to post or transfer the costing information of your ingredients okay these blue tabs are broken up by category so in this case we're talking about dairy products the other tabs i believe are uh, produce grocery um, things like that okay for your meat products put it in grocery okay um, so here's where i put all of my dairy products or the cost information for my dairy products I put the product name here under product description, the pack size if necessary, okay? If there's no specific pack size, just put the word package in there, okay? Um, some uh, ingredients, like the one I had mentioned before, uh, let's say pigeon, right? A pigeon does not come in a particular pack size. It comes um, in the purchase unit is each, so you would just put package in there, okay? Just to make it simple, okay? Um, and then you put the uh, the costing information in. So in this case, my salted butter um, comes, uh, you know, it's one pound for four dollars and thirty five cents. So the count or the weight, in this case, it's one. The purchase unit or the unit of purchase, in this case, it's pounds. And here's the costing information per unit. Okay. Um, for the purposes of this assignment and even this course. Try to stay with metrics like kilogram, gram, milliliters, liters, or you know, bunch or each. Okay, this is going to help a lot when you go to do your your recipe costs. Okay. In our our next tab or our next column here, we have the recipe unit. So while these this unit here is the unit of purchase. Okay, so one pound, you have to identify in what unit of measure you use this product in your recipe, right? So for example, this is uh, our salted butter comes in one pound for $1.35. What unit of measure do you use it in the recipe? Do you use it in grams? If you do, you would put grams there, okay? If you used it in pounds, you would put pounds there. If you used it in uh, liquid form, you would put milliliters. Okay. The assumption section is kind of important. Okay. So your assumptions, um, just I'm just going to read it. Should your recipe unit differ from your purchase unit, you must make an assumption as to how those two can be converted. Okay. You do not need to make assumptions in all cases. For example, it, let's just say my salted butter came in kilograms, or the cost of my 
my salted butter came in kilograms. So one kilogram for $35. If I needed to, if my recipe unit was grams, I don't need to make an assumption because I can convert very easily between kilograms and um, kilograms and grams. Okay. Um, while I understand the difference between, you know, grams and milliliters are, is, is negligible, okay, you would have to put an assumption here if you used your salted butter in milliliters, okay? Um, the assumption helps you communicate to me how you would convert between the two um, uh, units of measure. Another example would be, uh, let's say we'll go with eggs. So it's not quite dairy, but it's just an example. Let's say your your eggs come in a, a pack of 12 for uh, for uh, four bucks. OK, so that's 12, 12 individual eggs for four dollars. Now, let's say you used your eggs in volume. Uh, so milliliters, how are you going to convert each egg, the cost of each egg to milliliters? Okay, you have to make an assumption. Okay, you can make an assumption that you know each egg is 50 grams, oh, sorry, uh, 50 milliliters. Okay, and that's what your assumption would be here, and that's how you're going to convert the cost from each to milliliters in your, uh, your, res uh, your recipe costs. Okay, so again, just to go over it again, if your purchase unit or unit of purchase differs from your recipe unit in that the two units of measure are not easily convertible, then you need to make an assumption and communicate how you would convert the costing information between those two units of measure. Okay, I, if that sounds funky, I've put some examples on Blackboard in the assignment instructions. Uh, so completing your, uh, the consolidation list here, you're going to transfer all of your costing information for all of your ingredients to the appropriate tab. So dairy, produce, grocery, seafood. You're going to identify the product, the unit of purchase and the cost, as well as the recipe unit, and make any assumptions that are necessary for all the ingredients you need. Okay? And it's important to remember that to do this, you're using the blue tabs in this particular worksheet. Okay. Um, I think that's really all I have to say about the entrepreneurship worksheet for now. Um, we're going to be using the same worksheet for assignment number three as well. Okay, so these assignments build off of each other, if you will. Okay, so that's all I have for this week. Um, please watch the other videos I posted to Blackboard. Uh, email me if you have any questions. Uh, and if you do have any questions that I can't help answer through email, which I probably can, um, come to office hours on Thursday, which are between uh, one, sorry, <laughs> 10 and 12 and one and three. Okay. Thank you for watching this video.